For today's Grim Adventure, we find ourselves in Seattle, Washington. Right now you're looking at the Space Needle. Well, it's a little hard to see because it's up there in the clouds. It's a rainy day here in Seattle, which means today we are visiting the Museum of Pop Culture, or they call it Mopop. They have a couple different exhibits here. They have Scared to Death, the thrill of the horror film, which we want to check out. There is a Nirvana exhibit I think is still here. And then there's the world of Leica. I can't believe all three of those exhibits are in this one spot and we're gonna see them today. We've been wanting to visit this museum for quite some time. And of course, this is our last day in Seattle. So we had to do it. It's like $30 a ticket, $30 for parking, unless you get here super duper early, but it's all worth it because on the inside, they got some pretty amazing things. I have a feeling this video today is gonna to blow our minds as well as yours. Wherever I come, I've had luck. It's come to my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that it stays? Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always a come in my way. If you come to the Museum of Pop Culture, it's like $30 to get in. I think that we said that earlier, but in order to see the Leica exhibit, which is this that we're gonna show you right now, it's $6 extra per person. So you kind of have to tag that on. Whenever we bought the tickets online, you didn't really see an option to add to it, but trust me when I say it is worth it. This is what's gonna make you lose your mind. You're gonna, you're gonna lose your mind. Oh yeah, we should also point this out. On the second floor leading up to the third floor, you have the giant skeleton from the hollow bones from the movie Kubo. So jumping around a little bit here, but it's massive and it's beautiful, just like everything else. They even have the pink palace from Coraline here. It is massive. Look at this thing. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we need this in our house. Every which way you look at the Pink Palace, it's just gorgeous. Hopefully this gives you somewhat of an idea of how massive it is. You can see Jessica sitting over there in front of the spider web. What you're looking at right now is puppet number nine of Coraline Jones, like the actual puppet. She's so cute. And then right next to her is Mel Jones and Charlie Jones, her mother and father. And of course, we got to get a shot like this looking down with the tray of buttons opened and man, such a fun movie. If you're a fan of the movie Coraline, some of this might look familiar. Tacked to these boards are different props and costumes from the movie. When Leica first began work on Coraline, Man, that's just, it's, it's really cool. They have so much stuff and we just walked into the exhibit. There's so much to look at. And right next to that, they have a display case filled with all the different costumes and a few of the different puppets that they used. Beautiful, right? And this is just the first room. The experience doesn't end there. Oh man. All right. This just keeps getting cooler and cooler and cooler. Oh man, I love it. Oh wow. There's just so much to look at. Look at this. You have the other mother's living room complete with a bug couch. Oh man. This is how we need our house to look like, our living room. And of course, you have to have other mother and other father. They also have the other YB. I can just hear his voice just looking at the puppet. And then right next to him, you got the ghost children. And then the tall ghost girl.
Aside from the Pink Palace, one of the other sets that I love the most about Coraline is the garden. And they have it here on display. Look at this. The pumpkin eyes, the flowers for the hair, the greenhouse for the, for the bow. Baby ghoul. This is amazing. I, I'm, I can't stop smiling. Doing what we do, we see a lot of museums and a lot of exhibits, but nothing is as perfect as a Leica exhibit. I mean, Coraline, Paranorman, it's perfect. We have to have Jessica stand right next to the display so you can kind of get an idea of how massive these things are. What you're looking at right now is Mr. Prendergast's study. Hey, can you imagine building this? In all the little detail. Man. Of course they would have the Blythe Hollow Witch statue here. And they have little Agatha here. I love that her eyes light up. There is just so much stuff to look at. I love, there's so many different photo opportunities too. Right? You gotta love it, you gotta love it. If you haven't seen Paranorman, you have to. If you haven't seen Coraline, you have to. I have no idea how long this is gonna be here for, but if you can make it to the Museum of Pop Culture, you need to. That brings us to the Puritan zombies next, and Jessica was just saying they don't even look like puppets, but they are. Jessica's just blown away that all of these puppets, everything from Paranorman, were all handmade and they all worked. So all of the cars moved, uh, lights blinked, eye eyeballs lit up. It's definitely something you don't see every day. Talking about taking it to a whole new level. So we jumped right into the creepy part of Paranorman first. I mean, that's what you're here for, right? But here's Norman Babcock, puppet number 23. And then right behind him, you have the family. And then the Blythe Hollow Middle School hallway. So much freaking detail. And then right in the middle of the Paranorman section, they have a little seating area where you can sit down and watch, well, clips of the movie as well as some behind the scenes stuff. They, they really did this good. Next up, it looks like we're going into the world of box trolls. Oh my word. This is insane. What you're looking at right now is the snatcher in his truck driving right down Tavern Street. And man, is it larger than life. This might actually be bigger than the Pink Palace. The detail is just mind boggling to me. Right here is Eggs, puppet number eight. And right beside him, you have fish, wheels, bucket, and shoe. Ah, they're so cute. And then right here, front and center, you got Lord Portly, Winnie Portly, and Lady Cynthia Portly. Again, there's a ton of photo opportunities and costumes and props and little knickknacks and doodads attached to the wall. Jessica's checking them out. Like I said, she loves little miniature things. This is pretty amazing. Next up, we have Kubo and the two strings. First up in the Kubo section is Hanzo's study. I'm gonna go by this one really slow because it is pretty freaking massive. Right? Man, all the different characters, all the detail, even just the paper laying on the ground, just thrown about. Wow. Next up, we have what's known as the Fallen Leaves Boat. Yes, they have it here, and it is incredibly huge. Man. Next up, we have the Sinister Sisters, 
right over here. As soon as we turned the corner, Jessica looked at him and she went, the sisters. But there they are in all their glory. The sisters, puppet number one and puppet number four. And right next to the sinister sisters, we have the moon beast. This thing is pretty menacing. This thing is definitely menacing, that's for sure. Go ahead, turn this way a little bit. Yeah, look at those teeth. Right here on display, they got Kubo puppet number five. Just look how beautiful she is. And this is mother puppet number two from the movie. Also on display, they have monkey, beetle, and little Hanzo. And would you look at that? They also have the moon king, puppet number two. Next up, we have missing link. Just gonna be completely honest with you guys. We haven't seen the missing link. So we gotta do our homework. We gotta watch this one, but still it is beautiful. The music, the visuals, everything about it, everything about this place is just out of this world. Like I said, we haven't seen the movie yet, but this character here is the elder Yeti from the movie. We have another display over here, larger than life. It says Sir Lionel Frost study. Right? They're massive. It's really neat filming this video because these are so detailed and they're so perfect that I feel like I'm filming a Leica movie for this video. Because they're so massive that you can just put the camera in and everywhere you move, it is the world. The label on this display says Adelina's Boat Cabin. And move the camera around a little bit so you can see a lot of the different detail in this one as well. It's smaller than most of the others, but it's still just as detailed. The Leica exhibit is beyond amazing. And to be honest, we could stay here all day long, but there are other places inside the museum that we wanna check out. <sighs> gotta take a breath. Gotta take a breath. I'm sad to leave it. Right? <sighs> all right. Onward we go. Next up, we have scared to death. Horror. We just noticed that the doors say PG-13, beware. You ready? <laughs> oh my word. As soon as we walked inside, there's these stairs. It's like a spiral staircase that goes down like into the pits of hell. And we're surrounded by people screaming, like images of people screaming. <laughs> down into the depths. Honestly, we really don't know what to expect. But there is this beating heart sound. And then we come across a bit of a, a walkway that is filled with a bunch of corpses wrapped up and hanging. I did not expect this to be at this place. Well, the first thing that we see is this guy right here coveralls worn by Tyler Maine and Rob Zombie's Halloween. Larger than life. This is the brutal Michael Myers. This is really, at least to me, the very first time Michael Myers became like more than just a man walking. He was violent and it was very controversial because of that. People liked the idea of Michael Myers just being the silent type, but no, it was more than that. Right here on the wall next to Michael Myers, they have, it's almost like a kill count. It's almost like collectible cards of your favorite villains and favorite monsters. We got one for Ghostface right next to Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. They got Hannibal Lecter represented on this wall. Norman Bates from Psycho. Got Hellraiser up on the wall with Pinhead. Candyman, of course. Annie Wilkes from Misery, number one fan, right next to Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. And this is just to name a few. 
We want to point this out for Ghostface. If you look right down here at his stats, it says likes, movie trivia, and long phone calls. They have the Nemesis costume from Resident Evil Apocalypse. Look how menacing this thing looks. Wow, it's massive. You can get up close and personal with the alien creature costume from Alien 1979. We have the costume, mask, and machete worn by Derek Mears as Jason Voorhees on Friday the 13th, 2009. Recently, we did a convention with them. And I think this is a great time. We're gonna post the link to that video in the description of this one where we met the cast. Man, that's just insanely cool. Be still my beating heart. You have Angelica Houston's costume from the Adams Family and Adams Family Values. This dress is iconic to anybody who loves horror or the Adams Family. Wow. What on earth do we have here? I've never seen anything like this before in a museum. It says Frankenstein, special effects switchboard used for Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and other films from 1930 to 1965. I'm officially blown away. Next up, it looks like we have a room dedicated to vampires. Right here in the center, that giant crossbow is from the movie Van Helsing where Hugh Jackman played Van Helsing, the famed vampire hunter. Oh my God, they have Mr. Pointy Steak. It was Sarah Michelle Gellar's steak from the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then from the 2011 remake of Fright Night, they have the stunt steak gun. Aside from the props in the center of this room, there's a whole bunch of stained glass windows and different plaques and different things that you can read that talk about the origins of the undead like this guy over here, but I absolutely hate reading things at museums. Instead, I wanna see the stuff. I wanna play with the stuff. And there's so much to see, so much to see. And you know how we love photo ops at the Grim Life Collective? There's a vampire coffin here. Oh yeah. That's the picture right there. Oh my freaking word. There's the clapper for the movie The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982. This is the burnt body from the thing. And then this blows my mind. I'm a big Kurt Russell fan. There is Kurt Russell's hat from John Carpenter's The Thing. Texas Chancellor Massacre 2003, we have a mask worn by Leatherface as well as some concept art. On display, they have the stick figure and high eight camcorder from the Blair Witch Project. They have the ax from The Shining. They have the hook from Candyman Farewell to the Flesh. Clawed hand from the movie, The Howling. Phantasm 2, and right above this, the machete from Dawn of the Dead. They also have Tom Savini's whip from the movie, From Dust to Dawn. Dare I say this might be the coolest thing inside this entire museum. How many times can I say that? But with all seriousness, Michael Jackson's Thriller, directed by John Landis, most of the time you only see Michael Jackson's costume. This one here is one of the zombies. It says, the costume worn by Elaine Baker in Michael Jackson's Thriller, 1983. That just blows my mind. Remember The Walking Dead? The governor's mansion, how he had aquariums filled with zombie heads? These are the actual zombie heads on display here. Last time I saw something like this, it was at the, the, the Walking Dead Museum where they filmed those scenes. And they just kind of had something on display. Nothing like this. How amazing is that? so grotesque and so lifelike Gregory Nicotero KNB EFX Jessica was just saying that for her it's the eyes that sell it 
That's what makes it realistic. Now, a movie that terrified me is called Videodrome. It starred James Woods and Debbie Harry from Blondie was in it. And they have a scene where James Woods is standing or kneeled down in front of the TV and he puts his hand against the screen and then it just kind of engulfs him. It's like this weird warping effect. And as you can see, Jessica's hand is going in there. Man. And now one of Jessica's dreams has come true. We are entering the sci-fi section. And basically, it's like walking onto a spaceship that's filled with a whole bunch of props. You can see some of them behind you. You ready? All right, you have been unleashed. Go have fun. Starting this room off with a T-800 from Terminator 2. And all its glory. As soon as you walk in on the left-hand side, There's a whole bunch of Terminator 2 stuff here. Here's a leather jacket worn by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right below that, got an 800 skull. Two of them. Special effects hand. And a forearm. Got Star Wars A New Hope. We got Greedo, mask and hands, and a concept sketch. The lighting in here is definitely a lot better than the horror section, I'll say that. There's some more Star Wars stuff. We got a Rebel Trooper costume from Empire. Here's a model from War of the Worlds. In this display case right here, we got three different things. The one on the top is a flamethrower used by Ripley, Sigourney Weaver in Alien 1979. The spear gun, right there towards the bottom, hers as well. And then this baseball cap is Harry Dean Stanton's. They even have some miniatures from Alien. Not just the creature suits. You gotta love that. We have a display case dedicated to Blade Runner over here. We've got some pictures, and then right about here, coming into screen, that was Harrison Ford's gun. And then right below it, Blade Runner film script. When it comes to Blade Runner props and costumes, this probably has to be one of the coolest that we've seen. It's probably one of the most notable from the movie. This was Zora's costume when she gets shot. Back up a little bit. Also from Blade Runner, they have Daryl Hannah's costume where she played the character Pris. Turn in the corner, we're greeted with an alien egg from the movie Alien Resurrection. It came out in 1997. Here's Nicholas Holt's Beast costume from X-Men First Class. All right, this is definitely up there with one of the coolest things I think this museum has. And that's a Cyberman costume from the TV show Doctor Who. Oh my word. Didn't expect to see that here. Off by chance you're not a Whovian. What you're looking at right now is a Dalek. It's an actual Dalek that was used in the TV show Doctor Who. And these things are terrifying. Does this guy look familiar? If you're a fan of the movie Galaxy Quest, he was the big bad guy, the villain. This is gonna be really, really hard to see. Not a big fan of how they're lighting stuff here, but the proton pack is from Ghostbusters 2. The parking sign is from Ghostbusters, and the ghost trap towards the bottom is from Ghostbusters as well. It is now time to enter the fantasy section of this exhibit. And the last time we did something like this, you actually cried because you saw Dark Crystal stuff. It was at the Center of Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia. Don't know what's inside, but it's gotta be magical. See what I did there? As soon as we walk inside, it's like they dump you out into a forest. There are sounds of birds, you've got trees, and everything's on display kind of nicely. You guys ready for it? Wait until you see this. Right here on display. Do you see it? Well, the plaque in the very back says Invisibility Cloak. Now do you see it? What am I looking at right now? Costumes from The Wizard of Oz. On the left, we have the Reluctant Guard. And on the right, the Cowardly Lion. I never thought I'd get to see something like this, but here they are. Oh my word. 
They have some Harry Potter costumes here. On the left, you may recognize that from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Right there in the center is Alba's Dumbledore's robes. And then right over here is Sirius Black's. Well, it's not the original, the Dark Crystal. It's the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. But here's the librarian. They even have the Book of Thra on display. The page is open to Agra herself. It's a rather small section, but what you're looking at right now is the puppet for Brea from Age of Resistance. And this cute tiny guy is a Pluffum puppet. And this whole museum, I think this might be the first thing that we've seen that has to deal with Batman. Actually, this is from Batman Forever, and these are the Riddler's grenades. Well, almost missed this. Glasses worn by Daniel Radcliffe as Harry Potter. And now we find ourselves on floor two, which is basically the music part of the Museum of Pop Culture. This structure that's behind me, it looks like an upside down Christmas tree, but it's actually made of guitars. There's a couple really cool things here, especially an exhibit on Nirvana that I wanna check out. There are a ton of different pictures of the band, especially in the earlier years, but what we're gonna to try to focus on is actual tangible things, like this suitcase right here. It says suitcase owned by Kurt Cobain, which he used as a makeshift drum for his organized confusion demo. That green shirt, it says fecal matter on it. That was created by Kurt Cobain. The next things that we wanna point out are these two cassette tapes in this display case. The one on the top, it says Nirvana's first demo recording, 1988. And if you look closely at the label, his name is actually spelled wrong. And then the one on the bottom says Nirvana demo recording, 1988. The poster right in the center of your screen is the first time Nirvana played, officially calling themselves Nirvana. This guitar party that's right here, Kurt Cobain smashed it. This is pretty wild to see. This is the 1989 cover layout for the album Bleach. Take a minute and look at it. And here's the album right over here. <laughs> Man, this is taking me way back. I've never seen this much Nirvana stuff in one location. These are the silk screens for Nirvana shirts back in 1988. And of course, right next to it, they actually have the shirt. This is the 1989 tour itinerary. The summer tour of 1989. And I like how it says July 9th, Pittsburgh, PA. And it looks like they're playing with Sonic Temple. The guitar on the left, another one smashed by Kurt Cobain. And would you look at that? Another guitar destroyed by Kurt Cobain, the one right there in the center, the black one. They should have a museum of their own. Would you look at that? This is one of Kurt Cobain's cardigans. It says that it was purchased from a thrift store right next to Nevermind the Album. And I can't believe I'm actually seeing this in person. It's the casting call for Smells Like Teen Spirit music video that they shot down in California. We did the filming locations. Um, of course, the link to that video is in the description of this video. Feel free to check it out. Man, that's really neat. Can you imagine? I mean, if you can go back in time, right? There's a lot to see in this display case. That sweater right there, Kurt wore that on the cover of Spin. And of course, there's the Spin magazine right there. Another guitar that Kurt destroyed, as well as the record for Insecticide. They even have a bunch of backstage passes and all access passes here on display too. To me, this is probably the coolest thing that they have here on display. It's the winged angel from in utero. Let me back up a little bit so you can just kind of take it all in. Look how beautiful that is. I can't believe I'm looking at that. I just want to reach out and touch it. And then we have some more guitars from the band. These ones are not destroyed. But I do want to point out this. If you look right between the necks of these two guitars, you see that hat? It's Kurt Cobain's hat. 
This guitar here is another one destroyed by Cobain, but what's really special about it, Kurt recorded and played most of Bleach on this one. Oh wow, they actually have one of the Black Ripper bass guitars here. Now these three items are in the center of the room with all the other memorabilia surrounding it. What you're looking at right now is one of Dave Grohl's drum kits. Supposedly he went through a lot of them because he was a pretty heavy hitter on the drums. Here's a shot from this side of the drum kit. Can I give you almost like a POV shot, if you will. First item on display is an alien from the movie X-Files Fight the Future, which came out in 1998. The thing is massive. Right next to that, we have a program costume from the movie Tron, 1982. It always cracked me up, like the costumes for this movie are just so simple, but yet it was so amazing. There's the placard for it right there. If you didn't know this, Jessica is a Star Trek fan and they have a tunic worn by Leonard Nimoy as Spock on Star Trek, 1966 to 1969. Now this is something you don't see every day. A screen-worn costume from the movie Blade Runner, which came out in 1982. It's the silk and snakeskin suit worn by Sean Young, who was Rachel in the movie. What you're looking at right now is Ridley Scott's personal script for the movie Alien, 1979. Right next to that, we have Newt's costume from Aliens, 1986. Yeah. And this is blowing my mind. It's a costume from David Lynch's Dune. Man. Now this is really cool. It is the special effects head for Keanu Reeves, who was Neo in The Matrix. They have the costume worn by Captain Nemo in the 1954 movie, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And then they also have the animatronic teddy bear from the 2001 movie, AI, Artificial Intelligence. It's a little hard to see behind the glass, but they actually have a sword that was used by one of the nine ring wraiths in the Lord of the Rings film series. You kind of make it out behind the glass. Look how beautiful that is. It's the jacket worn by Ellen Ripley, the 1979 movie Alien. Usually you walk into museums like this and then you see all you see is like, you know, the aliens themselves, but very rarely any costumes. So this is kind of cool. This might be one of the coolest things that are here in the Hall of Fame, especially if you're a Star Wars fan, or more importantly, Empire Strikes Back. Right over here, they have the lightsaber and the severed hand prop from Empire. Look at that. That's pretty wild. And if you're a fan of the movie Iron Man, well, here's one of the stunt helmet masks from the movie, which came out in 2008. And you gotta love Planet of the Apes. Here's a costume worn in the 1968 movie. And with that being said, I think it's about time that we call it a day. We've been here for about five hours and we've pretty much seen everything. We didn't show you guys everything because we want you guys to come out here and experience it yourself. And things change all the time. Like right now, the big exhibit is Hidden Worlds, the films of Leica, I think it's called. And it was breathtaking. Like I said at the very beginning, it's like an extra $6 a person on top of your worth ticket. It. So worth it. Worth it. Lit so beautifully. Leica was made for a museum. Yes. Right? Yes. Did you have um, a favorite part aside from Leica? Aside from Leica? Aside from Leica. Oh. Um, I would say that the sci-fi and horror are kind of tied with each other for me. Yeah. There, there was a, we felt that there was a little bit of problem with lighting, like things could have been lit a lot better, but for the most part, there's no museum like this. This place blew us away, except for the fantasy section. I was a bit disappointed. Yeah. It was so small and so dimly lit that it was difficult to see it with just your eye, and it, there wasn't very much in it. We were so excited for the fantasy section that we saved it for last, because we figured this one here was going to be crying because of some Dark Crystal stuff. But it was as soon as we walked in, we were walking out. It was it, there wasn't much to it. The Age of Resistance stuff that was cool. That was cool. Got to see Freya. And the Wizard of Oz stuff was that was really cool. 
I had no clue. With that being said, thank you for joining us on another grim adventure, this time from Seattle at the Museum of Pop Culture. Till next time, happy Halloween. Wherever I come, I'm in love. It's coming my way. Wherever I go, hard luck is that it stays. Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always coming my way.